We saw from Table E that during 1864, out of a total profit of 4,368,610 pounds, free money grubbers pocketed only 262,610 pounds. That in 1865, however, out of a total profit of 4,669,979 pounds, the same three virtuosos of abstinence pocketed 274,528 pounds. In 1864, 26 money grubbers took 646,377 pounds. And in 1865, 28 money grubbers took 736,448 pounds. In 1864, 121 money grubbers took 1,066,912 pounds. In 1865, 186 money grubbers took 1,320,996 pounds. In 1864, 1,131 1, money grubbers took 2 million. 150,818 pounds, nearly half of the total annual profit. And in 1865, 1,194 1, money grubbers took 2,418,933 pounds, more than half of the total annual profit. For the lion's share of the yearly national rental, which an inconceivably small number of land magnates in England, Scotland, and Ireland swallow up is so monstrous that English statesmanship finds it inappropriate to afford the same statistical materials about the distribution of rents as about the distribution of profits. Lord Dufferin is one of those land magnates. That rent rolls and profits can ever be excessive, or that a plethora of rent rolls and profits is in any way connected with the pl plethora of popular miseries is, of course, an idea as disreputable as it is unsound. Dufferin keeps to the facts. The fact is that as the Irish population diminishes, the Irish rent rolls swell. The depopulation benefits the landlords, thus also benefits the soil and therefore the people, that mere accessory of the soil. He declares, therefore, that Ireland is still overpopulated and the steam of emigration still flows too sluggishly. To be perfectly happy, Ireland must get rid of at least one-third of a million working men. Let no one imagine that this lord, who is also a poet, is a physician of the school of Sangrado, who, if he failed to find an improvement in the condition of his patient, ordered bloodletting after bloodletting until the patient lost his sickness when he had lost his blood. Lord Dufferin demands a new bloodletting of one-third of a million only, instead of about two millions. But in fact, unless these two millions are got rid of, the millennium cannot come to pass in Erin. The proof is easily given. The centralization has, has, from 1851 to 1861, mainly destroyed farms of the first three categories, under one and not over 15 acres. This gives 307,058 surplus farmers and reckoning a low average of four persons per family, 1,228,232 persons. On the extravagant assumption that a quarter of these can again be absorbed after the completion of the agricultural revolution, there remained for emigration 921,174 persons. Categories 4, 5, and 6, including farms of between 15 and 100 acres, are, as has long been known in England, too small for the capitalist cultivation of corn, and almost infinitesimal from the point of view of sheep breeding. On the same assumptions as before, therefore, there are a further 788,761 persons to emigrate. Grand total, 1,709,532. And as appetite grows with eating, rent rolls' eyes will soon discover that Ireland, with three and a half millions, still continues to be miserable. Miserable because she is overpopulated. Therefore, her depopulation must go further, still further, in that she may s fulfill her true destiny to be an English sheep walk and cattle pasture. Like all good things in the world, this profitable mode of proceeding has its drawbacks. The accumulation of the Irish in America keeps pace with the accumulation of rents in Ireland. The Irishman, banished by the sheep and the ox, reappears on the other side of the ocean as a Fenian, and there a young but gigantic republic rises. 
more and more threateningly to face the old queen of the waves, Acerba Fata Romanos Agum. <laughs>